Uh, buenos días a todos. Me, ¿Se escucha bien? Este, voy a cambiar de, eh, de, lengua, de idioma. Eh, iba a hablar en portugués. Uh, eh, to me, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome uh, Dr. David Watkins to, to our uh, institution. I have known David for quite some time. Uh, I'm not going to say how many years. But he's one of the leaders in the field of um, AIDS vaccines and also immunology and typing the MHC class 1 and class 2 uh, in rhesus macaques. Um, to my surprise today, after knowing David like, I don't know for how many years, uh, he told me that he was uh, raised up for quite some time in Trinidad, Tobago, that he loves the tropics, that every year he goes to Brazil for the carnival, and he loves everything Latin. Now, if you look at his CV or bio sketch, you cannot realize that, okay? He was uh, trained in England, uh, got his PhD in Rochester, and then in Harvard he did a, a fellowship in uh, immunology. So not very much of a Brazilian touch there. And he had an astronomical and very productive career uh, from assistant professor in pathology at Harvard to now a professor of pathology at Wisconsin. In terms of uh, ways he uh, spending his leisure time. Um, he's an uh, editor of Immunogenetics. Uh, he's a part of the editorial board of that uh, magazine, also of the Journal of Virology. He has received many awards, uh, has hundreds of publications, and I believe now he has like four R01s and an R21 and things like that. So I think like Maybe he has, he says, also four hours a day to practice Portuguese, and, and maybe he will give us the recipe how he does all those things. But to me, it's a real pleasure to, to have him here today, uh, exploring perhaps ways of collaborating with the Primate Center and with AIDS researchers here. And the title of his seminar is Elite Controllers and Vaccine Studies in the SIV Infected Indian Rhesus Macaque. David? Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear? Uh, thank you, Edmundo, for that introduction. And you're right. When you listen to me speak, it's not clear that I have a, a deep and all-abiding love for everything south of the Mexican border. Um, I, uh, as Edmundo said, I, I was born in Africa, and I went to Guyana, and I lived there for a couple of years. Then I went to Trinidad and Tobago which I regard as home. And, um, and when I was 11, I, my parents left Trinidad and Tobago, which is a beautiful island with all the flora and the fauna of the South America, beautiful weather, lovely people, a huge mixture of races, a huge black influence, which I think adds to any country's culture. And I went to Britain. I went to a British boarding school, all male, all white, <laughs> and it rained all the time. <laughs> and this was very, very distressing for me, and it was very competitive because I was at a boarding school. So you can imagine 60 boys, aged 12 to 14, all under the same house without any parental control. In fact, I've realized recently that it was child abuse. Furthermore, <laughs> if you didn't, if you didn't get into the equivalent of Harvard or Yale, you were considered a failure. Your life was over. So all, everybody was highly competitive trying to get into these two colleges. And if you didn't, you were a failure. So I suffered under that regime. I went to university in Britain as well, which was just as bad, full of pompous British people pretending to do science. And then luckily I came to the United States of America, which is still the land of opportunity. It has many faults. Its foreign policy is horrible, I agree. Um, but it allowed me to be a creative scientist. And about five years ago, 
my brother was a marine biologist in, I have two brothers, one who's a marine biologist who's tra who used to live in Ecuador and, and lived in Brazil at that time, and my other brother is in charge of the Charles Darwin station in Ecuador. So they all speak Spanish and are very South American, very socialist. Anyway, so about four years ago I went fishing with my brother in Brazil and instantly fell in love with the country. And I realized why this was is because to me it was the same as Trinidad and Tobago. The flora and the fauna were the same. The mixture of races was the same. The carnival was the same. The music is very, very similar. And it's this African um, influence that I find so interesting. The passion for life is, makes America look very poor in spirit, really. So yes, I am a, I, I am a unabashed fan of everything South American. Now, I, when I was about a year ago, uh, my son went away to college and I was very depressed because he's a very good friend of mine. And I decided to write a novel. And I wrote this novel about the difference between Brazil and the lifestyle in Brazil and my British boarding school. So it was this contrast between color and fun and beautiful women to rain, <laughs> no color, no music, all men, all white. <laughs> so it's just like this. <laughs> so anyway, there you have it. This is why I love everything south of the border. Okay, so on to more serious uh, issues. Uh, and in fact, one of the, I, want, I applied for a Bill Gates grant and I wanted to start the grant <coughs> with a conversation in Portuguese between two Brazilian women in Bahia talking about HIV. But unfortunately, I was not allowed to do that by the various people in my lab. They thought that was a bit corny. Today, I'm going to show you some very encouraging vaccine results. It has been very difficult to find a vaccine for HIV, as many of you know. And this virus has frustrated us. And the only way to test the vaccine is in non-human primates. And that's the real use of these uh, animals. Unfortunately, recently, people have suggested that it's possible to find a vaccine using SHIV, which is a chimera between HIV and SIV. The problem is is that that virus is not HIV nor SIV. And I think it's gone a long way to misleading the entire community as to whether it's possible to make a vaccine against this virus. It's done us a huge disservice because there really is no good data showing any amelioration of disease after SIV challenge. So, Distinguish between SIV and HIV. Very important, SHIV and SIV. SHIV really has done us a huge disservice. So what I'm going to show you today is a collaboration with Merck, the leading vaccine company in the world, um, showing some hope that it is possible to make a vaccine against this virus. Now, what I'd like to start with is some data showing that, now, many of you may not know what this is. This is a, a clone virus that was made by Ronda Rosius. It is the worst virus known to monkeys. Very aggressive, very difficult to neutralize, has a set point of 10 to the 6 copies per ml, and is possibly the most pathogenic virus that we work with. But I'm going to show you that there are monkeys that can control this virus. And that gives me hope that it is possible to make a vaccine against HIV and SIV. And then I'm going to show you some new studies that are unpublished. We're hoping to submit this work within the next month. In fact, I'm going to spend tomorrow writing this paper up um, with GAG, TAT, REV, and NEF. So let's start first with these rare monkeys that control virus infection. We have now infected 160, more than 160 monkeys at Wisconsin with this awful virus, SIV-MAC-239. Most of these animals have a set point of about 10 to the 6 copies per ml. 
This is viral copies per ml. So 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth. So this is a million copies per ml. And there's a no initially a peak up to 10 to the seventh, and then there's a set point. So most of our monkeys look like this. We have some animals that die very soon after infection. And then we have some animals that show some control, but not a great deal. And then we have these very rare animals, which we've called elite controllers. They're called elite controllers because um, in humans, you see the same phenomenon. And Bruce Walker, who we collaborate with, has called his humans elite controllers. So that's why we call them elite controllers. So if you look at these, uh, our average animals, we have 130 of them. And if you look at these two alleles, MAMU B17 and AO1. So let me explain what this is. MAMU is macaca mulata. B is the B locus. 17 is an allele at that locus. So this is, if any of you know what human MHC typing is, HLA, it's the same sort of thing. So out of our crashes, we have 10. Remember I told you those were a rare subset. No B17 animals. But look at our elite controllers, less than 1,000 copies per ml. And you can see that 7 out of 11 are, in fact, B17 positive. Now, this has a parallel in the human situation because, as many of you know, HLA B27 and B57, if you have those two alleles, you do pretty well after HIV infection. So here are our 11 elite controllers. These are the animal uh, numbers, and here are their individual traces. They all have clear infections. They have a peak of viremia, and then they control the virus. Now, some of these animals have been vaccinated, but they've been vaccinated with viruses that really don't do anything to the virus. So here, this is with a single CTL epitope. In the rest of the animals, it did nothing. So I don't really think this can be counted as a, a vaccination. This is a lipopeptide with a single CTL epitope. These are not vaccines that are going to do anything against this virus. Several of them have received no vaccine at all. So I don't think vaccination had a lot to do with their elite controller status. All of these animals are antibody positive. They are all mounting strong antibody responses. So here are their antibodies. Here are the chronic virus loads, and the present virus load is in parenthesis. So they've all got very, very low virus loads. Um, and these are their CD4 counts. They've maintained good CD4 counts. So these are a unique set of animals. Now, if you test their sera in classic neutralizing antibody assays, that is with virus and rhesus macaque PBMC, then you see no neutralizing antibodies at all. 239 is notoriously difficult to neutralize. However, if you use a pseudotyped virus, you find evidence for neutralizing antibodies in some of these animals. So they are making antibodies, and some of them are neutralizing. So what happens if you take PBMC out of these animals that have very little or no virus, and you CD8 deplete the PBMC. So here are CD8 T cells here. So these are the CD8s. Here are the CD4s. This is after depletion. So we take blood from the animal. We separate out the PBMC. We deplete the CD8s. And then we PHA stimulate and add IL-2. We want to grow the virus out of these animals. And in fact, we can grow virus out of these animals, suggesting that something is keeping this virus in check. We are now sequencing this virus. The interesting thing is that this virus doesn't have many changes from the cloned <coughs> virus that we use to infect these animals. So what type of immune responses are there present in these elite controllers? Why is that important? Well, if we understand why these animals are controlling their virus, then maybe we can make a vaccine based on that information. So we detect CD4 responses using intracellular cytokine staining, which is a very simple technique. You take the PBMC and you stimulate them with peptides. We have a set of peptides, 15 mers, that overlap by 11 for the entire SIV-MAC239 viral genome. 
we test our PBMC in batches using 10 to 50 peptides. We also have a set of peptides that are tenmas that overlap by nine for several of these uh, SIV genes. So here's a positive control. This is IL-2 and interferon gamma, negative control. And here's a CD4 response to a peptide in REV. And this is a common CD4 response. Remember that SIV and HIV infect CD4 cells. And normally, in a pathogenic infection, we deplete all our CD4 cells. So we don't have CD4 responses normally. So this is quite a surprise to see these CD4 responses. And in fact, they make reasonably broad CD4 responses. So here's our GAG peptides. Here's our NEF peptides, REV, VPX, VIF, Envelope, and POL. And as you can see, here are our animals. And they make immune responses against quite a number of different regions of the virus. These are CD4. Ah, ha, the CD8. I hope this doesn't happen to any other slide. <laughs> the CD8 responses are also very, very broad. Now, I'm going to tell you an anecdote about one of our macaques, 96112. It was challenged in 2003 with a high dose of SIV MAC 239. It had borderline plasma virus loads at weeks 2 to 28. And we just started working with our real-time PCR assay. And we weren't really sure that these were positive. We rechallenged it in November 2004 with a high dose of SIV MAC 239. And then we looked at virus replication. When we rechallenged this animal, I asked a graduate student to look at the immune responses in all of the animals he challenged on that day. This is an Ella spot uh, plate. Does everybody know what Ella spot is? Who doesn't know what Ella spot is? OK. So basically, we take PBMC, and we put them into a well, and we ask, and then we put in peptides, and we ask them to make a response to those peptides. And if they make a response, you have spots like this. Um, which we then stain for secretion of interferon gamma. So here is our positive control. This is no peptide. And on this plate are all the peptides that bind to MAMU B17. And as you can see, this animal had a huge immune response to one peptide in NEF and a huge response to a peptide in ENV, but only those two. And normally when we see animals with massive immune responses, it only means one thing. It means that they have very high virus loads. But in this case, that wasn't the case. This animal had very, very low virus loads. So here is this animal. You can see a small peak when it was first infected. And then it was rechallenged. And it had another peak, but only up to about 10,000 copies per ml, which is very low. Typically, when we infect an animal, we get between a million and 10 million copies per ml. And now it's gone on to control its virus. So here we have an animal that really has never had much virus replication, but it's clearly resistant to a second challenge. We then mapped the CD8 responses in this animal by Spot and ICS. It has immune responses to 21 different epitopes in the virus. So. Why do these animals control virus replication, especially such a highly pathogenic virus? We have one clue. They all express MAMU B17, Macaca mulata B locus, the 17th allele. So a graduate student in my laboratory has developed a new assay to test CD8s. Now, when you test CTL or CD8s, you normally carry out a chromium release assay. So you take B cells, you label them with chromium, and then you pulse them with huge amounts of synthetic peptides. And you ask the CD8 cells to kill those chromium labeled targets. Highly artificial. SIV doesn't infect B cells. And if you pulse anything with a large enough amount of peptides, you'll get things to kill. 
So we developed, well, John Lafredo developed a new assay called the viral suppression assay. Because what do CD8 cells do? What do CTLs do? They close down the virus factory. And that's the assay that we wanted to test in these animals. So we take PBMC and we deplete the CD8 cells. We then stimulate for um, overnight with PHA. We add virus. And now we have infected CD4 cells. We then add in our CD8 cells that can be tetramosorted, and we culture for a period of time, and we look at virus growth in the supernatant. So we're trying to shut down the virus factory. And when we do this, now, here is virus copies per ml in the supernatant. Here are days post-infection. No CD8 lymphocytes. We get good levels of virus growth. So if we just take CD4 cells, that are activated and we dump virus in, the virus is going to attach, get inside the cells and start replicating. Very straightforward. Now, if we add in CD8 cells, what will happen is the virus will get into the cells and it'll start to put viral peptides up on the cell surface of the infected cells. The CD8 cells will come along and close down the virus factory and there'll be no virus in the culture. And that's exactly what happens, especially when you put in this type of CD8 cell. Now, remember I showed you an Ellis spot earlier? This is the epitope that was in that Ellis spot, NEF IW9. So what we think is happening in these B17 animals is that they mount a very strong and potent immune response to one region in NEF. And this is the NEF IW9 <coughs> epitope. And these CD8 cells are very good at closing down the virus factory. Now, obviously, this isn't the only thing that they do. And it's not the sole reason that they're protected from virus growth in the chronic phase. But it might be um, one of the contributing factors in control of virus replication. These are the most effective CD8s we've ever seen in any culture. So I want to summarize this part of the talk now before I move on to the vaccine studies that employ some of the ideas that we've got from this part of the talk. Now, our elite controllers are all challenged with the same virus. This is important because many elite controllers, many human elite controllers, we don't know what virus that they were challenged with, right? Because many of them are actually challenged with viruses that have mutations that may have, may cause a less fit virus. But these animals, all challenged with exactly the same clone. So that differentiates them from human elite controllers. They mount broad, low-frequency CD4 responses, and they mount broad, low-frequency CD8 responses, except for that animal, 96112, which had huge immune responses. They're ser seropositive, but there's no evidence for neutralizing antibodies against 239. So it looks as if these animals, the cellular immune response is controlling virus replication. And perhaps it's the cellular immune response to NEF that's controlling virus replication. So now we're going to use what we learned from our first study in the second study. We're going to vaccinate animals with a DNA prime and an ADNO5 boost. This is the most potent way of generating immune responses that I know of. AD5 encoding GAG is now in human clinical trials and shows the most promise to test whether CD8 cells can control this virus. So where are you going to use GAG, TAT, REV, and NEF? Remember NEF had the epitope that we think might be important in the long-term controllers. So many of you are not vaccinologists. Many of you have not worked with SIV before, so I would need to explain a few key facts. SHIV is unlikely to be predictive of HIV challenge. This is an artificial virus taking HIV envelope and putting it into the backbone of SIV MAC 239. And what you end up with is a virus that's neither SIV nor HIV. 
especially 89.6p is a virus that's relatively easy to neutralize. Now, SHIV has its utility in looking at sterilizing immunity. So that is, if you have an antibody or you have a vaccination regimen that induces antibodies, if you challenge animals and they're completely protected, then I think that's a reasonable way of using SHIV, depending on how neutralization sensitive those SHIVs are. But what has happened is that people have challenged with SHIV, they've got infected, and then the virus has been controlled in the long, in the long term in vaccines, uh, in vaccinated animals. That is not a good use because almost any vaccination will cause that. It's an easy virus to neutralize. And in the chronic phase, if you get over the acute CD4 loss, you do just fine. So we're left with these viruses, 239, 259, 251, and E660. And actually, any of the SIVs are probably good challenge viruses. Now, a lot of vaccinologists have used envelope in the vaccine. This is not informative. And I'll tell you why. The most diverse region of HIV is the envelope. It has lots of differences from one strain to another. So if you vaccinate an individual in Durban, South Africa, with one envelope, the incoming virus will never be exactly matched because of the huge diversity in envelopes all over the world. So there's no sense in using envelope, especially homologous envelope, in any vaccination regimens because it confuses the issue. So, and if you want to sort out what the important part of a vaccine regimen is, is it the cellular immune response, is it the antibody response, then you've got to take envelope out. Because once you've got envelope in, you're going to have antibodies against envelope. So you're never going to be able to say that your vaccine was successful because of the vaccine-induced cellular immune responses. Now, cellular immune response-based vaccines, no envelope, have largely, almost completely failed to ameliorate disease progression in SIV, not SHIV, SIV challenge models. Two exceptions, though, and I'll talk about those later. We're going, it's going to be a long time before we have an envelope-based vaccine. It's very difficult to generate neutralizing antibodies, and it's very difficult to generate broadly reactive neutralizing antibodies. What do I mean by that? Only a few antibodies will actually bind to envelope and neutralize it. But remember I told you that envelope was very variable. So a neutralizing antibody might bind to one envelope, but it won't bind to all the other envelopes. So you have to have a neutralizing antibody that binds to a really conserved region of envelope. And these are very, very difficult to find. So I think that we won't have a real envelope-based vaccine for a long time. So we are stuck with generating a vaccine for, that will induce cellular immune responses. Now, a cellular immune response vaccine will not provide sterilizing immunity. Because remember how cellular immune responses work. They close down the virus factory. So you have to have virus replication for a cellular-based vaccine to work. So we think about vaccines like this. Here is what happens in HIV. You have a peak of viremia, and then you get uh, chronic phase viremia. In humans, the average virus load is about 30,000 copies per ml, at least so Bruce Walker tells me. Now, what I want to do with the vaccine is reduce the chronic phase viremia because I want to reduce transmission. So if I reduce chronic phase viremia, I have much better chance of living longer and I will not transmit the virus. How do I know this? There's a study in Rakai of discordant couples. One of the individuals is infected and the other individual is not infected. And they looked at transmission within this cohort. And what they found was very interesting. 
If the HIV-infected individual had less than 1,000 copies of, per ml of virus, there was no transmission to the spouse. So what I want to do is control virus in the chronic phase. So that's how we think about vaccines. Also, if I reduce chronic phase viremia, I'm going to be much, he much more healthy. Now, there's another problem. There was a paper published, two papers, in Nature three weeks ago. And I don't know if anybody has seen those papers. But what they found is that in the acute phase, when you have massive virus replication, you lose all of your effector memory cells, your CD4 cells. So these were two papers that I'd encourage you to read. They're really very, very nice um, uh, papers. There's a News and Views in Nature, and, and, and Lewis Picker and I wrote a News and Views for Nature Immunology about this phenomenon. And what, this, what they found is that, let's look, on this axis we have percentage of CD4 memory. Okay, So these are the really important CD4 cells. And what happens in the acute phase is that you lose them all. They all, almost all of them get infected. 70% of all your memory cells get infected. Right? This is terrible. So all the CD4 memory, remember that the CD4 cell is the most important cell in the immune system. It's like the general. You know, CD8 cells, CTLs, they're like guns. You know, if you don't aim them properly, you have no chance. The CD4 cells are the most important cells. And what happens is that they all get infected and killed. Not all of them, but about 70% of them get infected and killed in the acute phase. So what we have to do with the vaccine is prevent this massive loss. So we think about vaccines in 239. Now we know that the set point is about 200,000 copies per ml. What we've got to do is reduce it by a log and a half, right? That's like reducing 30,000 to 1,500 copies per ml in humans. So I want to get the chronic phase virus down to about 6,000 copies. But I want to prevent this horrible loss. That means I've got to knock down the peak as well. So I'm setting the stage here. My goal of our vaccine is to get a peak that's lower and a set point that's about 6,000 copies per ml. And I have to avoid the massive kill-off of the effector CD4 cells. Again, these CD4 cells are the best cells that you've got circulating in you at the moment. Because remember, they're memory cells against all sorts of different other pathogens that you've seen. All right, so we've already done an experiment using GAG only. And this is under submission at the Journal of Virology at the moment. So this is a collaboration with Merck. And what they did was gag encoding vaccines delivered by DNA prime. And a DNA prime is very, very important, as I'll show you in a minute, followed by an AD5 or Sendai. This is a collaboration with a Japanese group that we have, can control 239 replication. However, the control is poor and transient and only in macaques expressing particular MHC class 1 alleles. So this is the first experiment that's under submission at the Journal of Virology. It's a collaboration with Merck using their clinical vaccine. And what was done was a DNA prime and a AD5 boost. Three DNA primes and then AD5. This vaccine only encoding GAG. So in blue, the naive controls, you see the peak of viremia. Here are copies per ml. This is days post-infection. And a set point of 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th. Very, that's exactly what we see. The vaccine group that worked is a DNA prime, AD5 in red, but only in MAMU AO1 positive macaques. Now, let me tell you about MAMU AO1. MAMU AO1 macaque emulata A locus O1, the first allele uh, described. This is a very common allele, and it binds an epitope in GAG, which is very immunodominant. Immunodominant means there's a massive response to this. And in AO1 animals, 
we get control of this virus. But it's not for very long. It's only for about 50 weeks post-infection. Actually, it's not significantly different at this point. You can see that after 80 days, the virus starts to come up. Now, in AO1 negative animals, there's no difference. So AO1 is doing something in this vaccine regimen. Also, not shown on this graph, if I don't use a DNA prime and I just use ADD5, ADD5, there's no protection at all. Very important point for vaccinologists. So ADD5, ADD5, no control at all. So you need a DNA prime and you need AO1 animals. So we looked for escape. Is everybody familiar with the concept of CTL escape? What happens is that this virus is amazing. It generates as many variants as you want. It has a huge population size in the acute phase, 10 to the seventh copies per ml, and every virus is different. Simple Darwinian evolution. You put any selective pressure on this virus and it will escape. It'll, the, the killer cells will kill all the viruses that it can recognize, and then there'll be a virus that it can't recognize. And what will happen is that that virus will have a selective advantage and start growing. And so CTL escape is a very common phenomenon. And we looked for CTL escape in this group of animals. So um, remember, this, these guys start to increase in their virus load. And the question is, is that due to CTL escape? The short answer is, no, it isn't. So this is an epitope. This is um, CM9 the epitope that's recognized by the AO1 animals and the bottom line is is that there's no escape. So it's not CTL escape. Now, Tetsu Matano, who's a very good virologist from Japan, has vaccinated animals with a DNA prime and a Sendai virus boost. Very potent vaccination regimen. Again, only gag. Here are his controls in blue. And here are some animals didn't control and some did control. So he got control, but only in five of the animals. So when you do an analysis statistically, there's no difference between the controls and the vaccinees. And what he found was really interesting. His vaccine had induced a CTL that selected for a mutant in GAG that wasn't very fit and couldn't replicate. And so what the CTL had done was select for a virus that couldn't replicate, which I think is pretty interesting. And it's a, it's a different way of thinking about escape. OK, can vaccine-induced cellular immune responses against early proteins ameliorate disease course? So what we're going to do is add more proteins to our vaccine. We're going to add NEF, TAT, and REV. Why NEF, TAT, and REV? These are the proteins expressed early on in the viral life cycle. And you can think that a CD8 cell is going to kill cells infected throughout the life cycle if NEF, TAT, and REV are on the cell surface. NEF also downregulates MHC class 1 and makes it much more difficult to kill. So SIB protein has nine, uh, proteome has nine proteins. These are the early proteins, NEF, TAT, and REV. These are the late proteins expressed 18 hours post-infection. Here's our experiment. This was carried out by Nancy Wilson in my laboratory. Eight AO1 Indian rhesus macaques, eight AO1 controls. DNA1, DNA2, DNA3, ADD5 boost, and then at 50 weeks, a repeated low-dose challenge of SIV MAC 239. Remember, our vaccine is GAG, TAT, REV, and NEF. We induced massive immune responses in these animals, as we expected, because this is the Merck's, I mean, this is their best vaccine. So if you look at tetramer staining, let's just have a look at which animal is a good one. Let's have a look at this animal, 00044. 23% tetramer staining of its CD8s, 1.2. So one in four of its CD8 cells in its periphery were directed against the AIDS virus. 
Only two of these were, uh, but only two epitopes here. Here are the Alice spots. These animals made responses to every one of the proteins. This is the breadth. This is the number of different epitopes recognized. A massive breadth, both CD4 and CD8. These were the best vaccinated animals I've ever seen in my life. So, how does this affect how many challenges it takes to infect an animal? There were five challenges for the vaccinees before we infected them, and five challenges for the controls. So it made no difference in the number of challenges. Remember what we do is a, a, a weekly challenge with a low dose to mimic HIV infection, which a, HIV infection is normally a low dose challenge. We challenge day zero, we challenge week one, week two, week three, week four. We take blood, if they're infected, we stop challenging the animals. So the question is, how many challenges does it take to infect these animals? No differences between vaccinees and controls. Now we had three animals that were very interesting. We found transient viremia. Now whether that's our assay being screwed up or whether it's real, I don't know. So I'm going to exclude these three animals from further study because we didn't go on and keep challenging them once we saw a positive uh, viremia. This animal, after challenge, made a massive anamnestic response. So after challenge with 239, this is animal 01008. This is tetramastaining. So here is the tetramastaining to gag. Here it is to tat. Here it is to another gag epitope. And here it is to a nef epitope. And you can see that we have 10, 12, 14, 18% um, staining to uh, five different CD8 epitopes. Now, we didn't use envelope in our vaccine. This is non-anamnestic response to an epitope in envelope as well. So these animals make a massive anamnestic response. Here are our control animals, exactly as we thought, a peak between 10 to the 7th and 10 to the 8th, a set point of above 10 to the 5th copies per ml of 100,000 copies per ml, what happens to our vaccinees? Well, we saw surprising amount of reduction in virus replication. We had three animals under 1,000 copies per ml out at 182 days post-infection. When we look at the averages, not the averages, but the geometric mean, here is the virus load. Here we have our controls with a peak of 40 million copies per ml and a set point um, out here of about 160,000 copies per ml. Our vaccinees had a reduced peak and remember that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to reduce the peak and you can see that they had about 5,000 copies per ml out at 180 days post-infection. This is the best vaccine result we have ever seen. Um, and if you uh, analyze this using statistics, these differences are statistically significant, according to my statistician. I have to admit, I don't understand anything about statistics. So the next question is, did we save the memory compartment? Remember the goals of the vaccine, under 6,000 copies per ml, we've achieved that. What about the memory cells? Now, this is a, a bit complicated, but actually it's very simple. Um, these are the effector memory cells, CD28, CD95 positive cells in PBMC. Here are our vaccinees in blue and here are our controls. This is the virus load and as you can see some of them have very very low virus loads and here are our controls. The average of CD4, CD3, CD28, CD95 positive cells was higher in our vaccinees than our controls. So the first question you'll ask is, was that statistically significant? And so we sent the data to the statistician. This is the distribution for our vaccinees. This is the distribution for our controls. And indeed, it is statistically significant. Now, let's look at the CCR5 
CD95 positive memory cells. And again, the average is 5% in the vaccinees and 2%, 2.5% in the controls. And again, that is also statistically significant. So what can we conclude? For the first time, we've shown that vaccine-induced cellular immune responses can control this terrible virus. No antibody, no envelope involved in this vaccination regimen. So we're not going to confuse the issue. We know it's cellular immune responses. The memory cell compartment also shows some preservation in vaccinees, which gives me great hope that these animals will continue to control their virus for a long time. Now, there are some caveats. First of all, they're all MAMOAO1 macaques. We need to do experiments in non-AO1 macaques. We need to try to understand whether it's the immunodominant responses. And in fact, one of the reasons I'm here is to set up a collaboration with your group so that we can submit an R01 for the next deadline to understand what is the nature of the control in, this, um, in these animals. Merck have agreed, at least I hope they've agreed, to keep providing us with all of these vectors. What happens when we add POL, VPR, VPX, and all the other SIV proteins? Will we get better control? What happens if we vaccinate MAMU B17 animals? Will all of them control? Because one thing I didn't tell you is that not all B17 animals control. So there's now a whole set of experiments that we absolutely need to do in this sit setting to understand why we've controlled this highly pathogenic virus. Now, the vaccine and the challenge virus were exactly matched. So the experiment that we want to do is do the same vaccination regimen and challenge with a heterologous virus, E660. Will it make a difference? Um, the challenge was six months after the last AD5 boost. Now, that's not going to happen in Africa you're not immediately going to get challenged six months after you've received your last vaccination. So how long do these memory cells last? And the last question is, how long will the control that we've seen last? And we don't know the answer to that. Maybe these animals will start to show, the vaccinees will st start to show increased virus replication. We just don't know. So I'd like to now actually thank the individuals that did the work, um, because I no longer work in the laboratory because I've got all these Portuguese lessons to go to. Um, <laughs> and I have to travel to Brazil at least six times a year so um, <laughs> to uh, keep me sane. So the University of Wisconsin, Nancy Wilson, who was actually in charge of my lab, uh, carried out the vaccination experiments. And Levi Yant, who is a graduate student in my lab, um, has uh, done uh, a lot of the work on the controllers. Uh, we have a very collaborative uh, laboratory. We have 11 graduate students at the moment. I'm always looking for more graduate students. We have a Colombian graduate student. I'm always encouraging. I need a Brazilian graduate student, Puerto Rican graduate student, lots of graduate students. Merck, Danny Casimiro, John Scheiba, and Fubu Wang have made these uh, vectors for us and helped us in the analysis. And it's really been a very good collaboration with this group. Um, at Oregon, Lewis Picker helped us with the CD4 analysis. He's the world's expert on CD4 cells in rhesus macaques and probably in humans. Um, our statistician is David Allison at the University of Alabama. And Dennis Burton is the, um, the guy in charge of the neutralizing antibodies, probably the world's expert on neutralizing antibodies. So I'd like to stop there and entertain any questions. Please don't be afraid to ask questions. No question. If you don't understand something, Please ask. I, 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 it's uh, much more important that you understand what I'm talking about than appear smart or stupid or whatever. So, <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, good questions. Um, so I think we reduced peak virus load. If you notice, there was a significant difference. And I think it's a stochastic.
opportunistic event that the more virus you have, the more likely you are to infect all your cells that have the right receptors. SIV MAC239 uses CCR5, which is a, uh, it's a, a marker of the memory cells. That's why it goes directly to the gut. Most of the CD4 cells in the gut are CCR5 positive, and it just wipes them out. And that's where the virus enjoys most of its early replication. We have done the gut biopsies. We've got the data. They're being analyzed as we speak. But the preliminary, there's a lot of CD4 memory, CCR5 loss in the vaccines as well as the controls in the gut. But yes, and we're also trying to do uh, lung lavages as well. But absolutely. I think these are the key cells, and that's what we have to try to preserve. And we haven't been completely successful either. In, in doing that. I wouldn't want to convey that image. Yes? Have you checked if your surviving memory cells are infected by, by the virus, whether they have virus or not? No, we, we haven't done that. But we do know that they are making uh, antigen-specific CD4 responses in the vaccinees. So that suggests that they're intact. But whether they're harboring copies of the virus in a latent phase, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure some of them are, but um, I don't know. And in, in the early stages, uh, when your memory cells are dying, mm -hmm. uh, is the CD95 expression higher on those cells than in the surviving ones? Don't know the answer to that. Don't know the, the answer. CD95 is a dead molecule, and it's a pass. And those cells, the dying ones, may have a high expression of CD95. In the, in, this, in, the, in the paper in Nature by Ashley Haas, there is a thought that it is fast-mediated uh, death that's going on in some of these cells. But you know, I think that that evidence is still a little bit shaky. I, I prefer the simple issue that get infected, virus replicates, and then kills the cell. But absolutely. No, it could absolutely be correct. Uh, oh, as many as you like. If they have integrated virus, uh, it's been shown that, that, that some <coughs> viral proteins may interfere with apoptosis. Could so do. So even if they have pass on their membrane, yeah. they may be resistant. Yeah. yeah. So they may be alive, but they may have virus inside, and they may be resistant. Yeah. I'm sure that there are lots of reservoirs uh, present, but, but I know that if you look at a heart-treated patient, it's very hard to amplify that virus from CD4 when you, um, CD4 cells, um, so by l looking at the genomic DNA. So that tells me that it's a very, very low frequency of these latently infected cells. But there may be a higher frequency in our vaccinees. You're absolutely right. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, in terms of the antibody response, yes. Uh, have you, uh, what type of antibodies are being produced? What isotype, whether they are TH1 or TH2? No, um, I'm not an antibody expert, but I collaborate with Dennis Burton, who is the world's expert on HIV-specific and SIV-specific antibodies. So what he's done in our long-term non-progressors is carried out a, um, a neutralizing assay, where he takes SIV, incubates it with a virus, I mean with the antibody, and then tries to infect PBMC. And what he finds is there's no antibodies in our long-term progressors that will actually uh, neutralize. But if he takes the SIV envelope and he uses a pseudotyped virus that expresses a GFP, um, and he uses the antibodies from the long-term non-progressors and then tries to infect uh, cells and if they grow, if they they become green, obviously they you know they, they can infect. He sees some antibodies that will prevent um, infection. So um, so what he's doing now is we've sent him actually last week on Tuesday all of the antibodies from these um, animals to see if there's a difference. And I would hypothesize that a vaccinated animal will probably make a better antibody response, irrespective of the vaccine. But because its CD4 cells are intact, it might, um, it might 
have antibodies that have a better affinity, they might develop better, they might mature better, and they might neutralize. So, you know, control is obviously multifactorial, and it's the CD4s, the CD8, and the antibodies. And so maybe antibodies in the more chronic phase may play a role. So I think looking at the antibody responses in these animals would be important, but I can only do a limited number of things. So. Right. So there's a very simple answer to that. I get whatever animals I can lay my hands on. Uh, we use an awful lot of animals. Um, that's not true. That's not true. You, you, you say that you don't want SDLD1. This is in the future. That's right. Because my veterinarian tells me that. But you know the old, the old story, beggars can't be choosers. And I'm a beggar. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I, but it's a very interesting point. I mean, do you want animals that are SPF? Um, I think you do in this setting. Because right now we're trying to understand simple concepts. I think if you confuse the situation with other viral infections, um, you know, it, it's going to be a problem in interpreting your data. For example, our vaccinees, um, we took B17 animals out of our groups because we don't want B17 because we know that a third of B17s are going to control um, and, and that could be a problem for interpreting our data but you're right in the um, uh, in the real world humans are infected with a variety of other diseases that could affect the T-cell receptor could affect a huge amount of you know lots of different things and uh, and maybe that would be a much better way but right now we're just in the infancy part of these experiments we don't even know what's what's causing this control. And we have to be, you know, very careful in delineating and, and reduce the number of variables. Do you think that viruses compete with each other? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I certainly, I mean, we have some animals that we can't infect. And so it could be that they've seen another virus that induces T cell responses that are cross-reactive. I mean, again, the thing about being a scientist is that you never assume anything. And you, 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 you could have to always be prepared for uh, an interpretation or a result that's completely different. So I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's entirely likely. And, and there's evidence in mice that if you infect with one virus, it'll affect the immune response to a subsequent virus because there are cross-reactive T cells that recognize similar epitopes between the virus. This is work done by Welsh at the UMass. And so, yes, I, absolutely. <laughs> Therapeutic vaccines. Um, you see, in natural HIV infection, I worry about therapeutic vaccines because unless they're treated immediately, very early with antiretrovirals, I worry that that immune system has taken such a massive hit in its CD4 memory compartment that you are going to be in some trouble trying to really vaccinate in that setting. I, I just worry that once infection has taken place, it might be more difficult to initiate an immune response. But again, the trick is never assume anything. And uh, <laughs> I'm always happy to be proved incorrect. But I, I worry about that because of the nature of this infection, especially in the all-important CD4 cells. Um, no questions from the junior members. This is women on the left, men on the right, is it? No students. I have to have one question from students. Come on. Come on. One question. Don't be shy. Oh. Maybe they will ask you a question over the coffee or something. 
questions, I'd like to thank you, David, for really a very, very excellent presentation. And I hope uh, this is your first uh, visit here. That will be the first of the very many to come. Okay. As I said, I hope we can we can form some sort of a uh, a collaborative um, uh, event going forward. And uh, you know, if any of you guys need anything from our laboratory in the U.S., then you only have to ask. It's a very sort of open house policy, and um, happy to help. Again, remember that uh, one of my goals in life is to is to help people south of me of this Mexican border. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and and I really enjoy doing it, and so and that that trend goes to student education. I go to Mexico City every year, and I teach in a, a course on histocompatibility for students. And as I said, I'm going to Brazil six times this year. I'm going to try to give my first seminar in Portuguese in August. That's why I need the four hours of uh, Portuguese a, a day a day uh, intensive summer course. So. Um, yeah, whatever we can do to help. We have a Colombian graduate student. We'll see how he works out. I've, I've had, and so on. You know, our lab is open. Yeah, maybe also uh, for the courses here. <laughs> we are going to take note about the offer, you know, of inviting him for, for courses in immunology and virology. Yeah, you're a great teacher. Thank, Thank you. you